Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and we are still working on Cenozoic uh, Earth history, so let's keep moving. So in terms of what was happening during the period after the Laramide orogeny, well it got quite interesting. We know that subduction returned along the west coast of North America and so we have a return of volcanism. And so for a period of time we have uh, the entire west coast of North America being one long convergent plate boundary so we, then we have the return of elevated terrain so mountainous terrain and lots and lots of volcanoes so this is obviously caused by the Farallon plate subducting underneath the North American plate now at present we actually have two fragments of plate subducting under North America or more accurately North America and Central America so subducting under North America we have the Juan de Fuca plate and subducting underneath Central America, we have the Cocos Plate. So the question then becomes is, well, how do we end up with this situation where we have these two convergent plate boundaries, which are subducted, uh, which are subducted, sorry, which are separated by a transform plate boundary, which is the, obviously the San Andreas Fault. And then we have the same thing to the north of the Juan de Fuca Plate. We have the Queen Charlotte Transform Fault Boundary. So how do we end up going from one long convergent plate boundary to two convergent plate boundaries and two transform plate boundaries? So something has clearly got to have happened post Laramide orogeny. So the cause of this is the westward movement of North America over the spreading ridge of the Farallon plate. Now, what this is going to do is it's then going to cut up this spreading ridge into individual domains and each of those individual domains is going to start producing its own oceanic plate essentially. So what we're going to see is we're going to see a, a picture in a few seconds that's going to show this process quite nicely. So here we go. So here is a diagram that's going to show what's happening in terms of the general movement. So okay, so in the Eocene and the Oligocene, so about 40 million years ago, we begin to see parts of Alaska and a little bit of Canada beginning to start making contact with the spreading ridge up here. So this means this spreading ridge is now subducting underneath North America and it's being destroyed. So once the spreading ridge is subducted, that's it. It's gone. We, you're no longer creating new oceanic crust. Now you'll also notice that because we have this long subduction zone right here, well, that obviously means that the oceanic crust here is subducting underneath North America and Central America, and so we have this general westward pull. Okay, now you can you can pretty much see what's going to happen straight away, can't you? You can see as North America moves westwards, it's quite clearly going to start making contact with this part of the spreading ridge right here, isn't it? And it's going to continue its westward movement. It's obviously going to subduct this part of the of the spreading ridge as well pretty quickly so let's see as you move to the next picture well pictures should i say here's what happened we can quite clearly see that as north america moves westwards well clearly it subducts this portion of the oceanic ridge the spreading ridge should i say and it subducts this portion of the spreading ridge so by 20 million years ago you can see that this is gone this is gone and north america has moved more westwards and so by this point what we're left with is a spreading ridge up here and a spreading ridge down here and they're now isolated from one another aren't they and then as north america has continued to move even further westwards this portion has slowly been uh, subducted more of this portion has slowly been subducted and now we're left with the rather small divergent ridge here of the Juan de Fuca plate now eventually North America will continue to move westwards and it will subduct the entire spreading ridge here and then that's it. This plate boundary here will become one long transform plate boundary. The same thing goes for Central America. As Central America slowly begins to move westwards, it's going to swallow more and more of the Cocos Plate spreading ridge down here. So that's how we ended up with our current situation. That's how we managed to go from this long convergent plate boundary in the early well, should I say in, in the middle uh, Cenozoic, to the modern situation that we have now with a very, very small piece of oceanic crust here and a very, well, a smaller spreading ridge down here. And obviously then we have a transform boundary here, so the San Andreas transform boundary, 
and then we have the Queen Charlotte transform boundary up here. Okay, so it's quite an interesting story, and it's quite an interesting uh, you know view of what happens when a continent rolls over a divergent plate boundary. So obviously the question then becomes, well, what's happening on the eastern side of North America? And the answer is, it's surprisingly quiet. So we obviously know about the formation of the Appalachian Mountains. We know it was a very complex story consisting of four separate erogenies, the Akkadian, the, the Taconic, the Akkadian, the Illigahenian, and the Achetan, all combined together to essentially produce you know, an area of raised terrain that runs all the way down the eastern seaboard of, you know, mostly of, well, of Canada, and all the way down the eastern seaboard of the US. So, you know, we know that. And we know this mountain range uh, is a story of the convergence of te you know, tectonics from essentially the, the start of the Cambrian, is when we start seeing this occurring, all the way through to the end of the Mesozoic. So we know it's a very you know, complex, interesting story. Now, by the Cenozoic, everything's calmed down. It's pretty boring. So we, what we know is by the end of the uh, Mesozoic, most of the, most of the stuff had calmed down anyway, and we know that by the end of the Cretaceous, what is now the modern day Appalachian mountain area was in fact a completely flat, you know, fluvial system. So it was totally flat terrain covered in large rivers. Think of a situation like Houston, essentially very, very flat terrain covered in rivers. That was the situation that we had in the Appalachian region. So we obviously have ourselves a bit of a problem, don't we? And the problem is, is how do we explain the modern day terrain that we see in the Appalachians, which is obviously, you know, hilly. You've got lots of, you know, you've got lots of, you know, you know, steep hills and deep valleys with the, you know, situation we had at the end of the Cretaceous, which was perfectly flat terrain. So clearly something's happened. So there are two preferred models to explain this. The first one is climate change and the second one is uplift. So climate change is the most straightforward. If there's a change in climate, particularly a change of climate that increases rainfall, where well, you're going to have the faster, you're going to have a faster rate of erosion for soft rocks. And as you probably know, the Appalachians consists of lots and lots of synclines and anticlines one after another. That means the same layer of rock will appear again and again and again and again, won't it? And now if that soft layer of rock is obviously exposed, it can be eroded and it will erode faster, obviously producing valleys, whilst the more resistant rocks will produce the high ground. And so, you know, it just kind of naturally makes sense, doesn't it? So all you have to do is you just have to make the climate in the Appalachian region a little bit wetter. Now, the other possible option is uplift. So there could be something that's actually pushing the piece of uh, continental crust on the eastern coast upwards. Now, when that happens, as you produce areas of elevated terrain, well, areas of elevated terrain naturally suffer quite high rates of erosion. And so that would then explain how you end up forming the river valleys, because obviously the rates of erosion pick up, the rivers start cutting downwards very, very quickly. And so, you know, you end up with the situation you have now. So, Obviously, the first question is, well, okay, climate change, you can do relatively easily. We've seen it you know, happen again and again and again throughout geologic history. But what about uplift? What, what are the things that could possibly cause uplift in that area? Well, the first one is called mantle forcing. And that means, you know, there's a convection cell underneath the area. So we know that there are convection cells in the mantle, don't we? Warm, warm mantle rises up and cold mantle sinks down. And so we have this circulation of the mantle. Now, if one of these rising cells happened to get stuck underneath the eastern seaboard of the US, as it rises up, it's naturally going to start pushing up the eastern side of the US slightly, isn't it? So that's one possible way that we could cause the eastern seaboard to start rising is mantle forcing. Another, another reason is the Farallon Plate. So what could be happening is this could be North America and the Farallon subduction zone is over here. And so the Farallon Plate is subducting down 
and as it's subducting down, maybe somewhere over here, it's causing some kind of mantle disturbance. And this mantle disturbance could maybe be producing magma or producing some other you know, feature that produces this area of the mantle to want to start to rise. And once again, the eastern side of the of North America begins to go up. That's another possibility. Now, the final possibility is a process called delamination. So delamination is when uh, the bit of mantle rock attached to the, the bottom of the crust falls off. So if you remember, at the bottom of both oceanic and continental crust, there's a very thin layer of mantle rocks stuck to the bottom. Now, every once in a while, that thin layer of mantle rocks can simply fall off. Now, if all of a sudden those mantle rocks fall off the bottom, the piece of the continental crust on the eastern side of the US, well, what's going to happen? It's suddenly going to be lighter and it's going to bounce upwards. So that's another possibility. Now, the thing you'll notice about these three ideas, mantle forcing the Farallon plate and delamination, is that they require quite big events to happen, don't they? Whereas climate change, well, Geologically speaking, that's quite simple and relatively small. So when it comes down to it, climate change is, on the whole, a far more reasonable argument, although you can't you know, completely deny the possibility of uplift being the cause. It's just you know, a more complicated idea, you know, whereas the more simple explanation tends to be the correct one. So this is the situation that we have. So during the late Triassic, obviously we still have the elevated terrain. By the time we're into the Cretaceous, it's been completely eroded away. So the mountain building happened in the Paleozoic. The mountain, the mountain destruction happened during the Mesozoic. And so by the end of the Mesozoic, the mountains are completely gone. The area is, a flat, is, is flat terrain covered in rivers, pretty much like Houston. And then all of a sudden we can see we have this elevated terrain here. And, you know, the reason for that could either be climactic or it could possibly be something to do with, you know, the crust being uplifted, as we were just discussing. OK, so what about the Gulf Plains? So what, what's going on down here in the Gulf region? Well, so following the regression of the Zuniapiric Sea at the end of the Cretaceous, we have our final marine transgression. So if you remember, we have our six marine transgressions. We have the Sok, the Tipikanu, the uh, Kaskaskia, the Absaroka, the uh, Zuni, and then finally we have the Tejas. Okay. So the Tejas is going to occur in the late Paleocene and Eocene epochs. So the Tejas itself, as you can see, it, was, it happened here along the Gulf Coast region. So it happened along the eastern seaboard, the Gulf Coast, you know, a little bit of uh, eastern Mexico. And that's pretty much it. You know, it, we can agree, it, this is a pretty small event, isn't it? You know, it's nowhere near, as the, you know, it's nowhere near the scale of the previous five. So the Teosopiric Sea was small, it was pretty brief, and its maximum extent was restricted to the Atlantic and Gulf Coastal regions in general. And a lit, we do see a little bit of... Um, a little bit of with the ocean making its way onto the land in the Calif in California as well. Not really too much though, just a little bit. So the uh, the furthest it managed to make it in in land was it moved up along the Mississippi River, and it made it to the uh, Mississippi uh, Arkansas Tennessee boundary. That's about as far as it made it inland. So I think we can agree this was not a particularly spectacular. Um, Apiric Sea. Okay, everybody. So this is a natural place to stop. So we're going to stop part two here. And then we're going to come on to part three. Where we're going to start talking about quaternary geology.